In this video, I'd like to cover the subject of troubleshooting two-wire data buses. Modern commercial aircraft today rely very heavily on data buses. Installed inside each airplane is dozens of independent avionics systems, and they all need to talk to each other. Shown here is an example of the wire that we're talking about. This braided metal shield prevents any surrounding electric field from inducing noise on the wire. Likewise, the wire is also twisted to prevent magnetic field interference. Combining twisted wire with a metal shield will give you protection from most electromagnetic interference. During this video, I'm going to represent our two wires this way. They'll be red and blue. Then I'll show the shield. And to indicate a long wire run, I will split the shield so that I can show you the wires on the inside. In the past, I've heard people say, it's only two wires. What could go wrong? Well, let's take a brief look at what could go wrong. The red wire could be open. The blue wire could be open or both red and blue. For the shield to work properly, one end of the shield has to be grounded. This wire could be open. In this situation, electromagnetic interference can cause database degradation. We can have a short between the red and blue wires, a short from the red wire to the shield, which essentially is grounding out that wire. Likewise, a short from blue to shield. Both wires shorted to shield. How about both wires shorted to shield and each other? By the way, there's a technical term for this condition. It's called a smashed wire. Looking at your shield, as we talked about earlier, one end is grounded. This allows any interference built up on that shield to go to ground. The other end of the shield is dead-ended, as in not hooked to ground. The reason for this is, if the other side of the shield was shorted to ground, the ground potential, 125 feet away, will be different. The different voltages felt on each end of the wire could be as many as several volts. And any time you have a conductor, like the shield, with different voltage potentials on each side, current will flow. This problem is called a ground loop, and the result will be your shield can be the source of interference on that signal wire. Moving away from shorts and opens, the red wire can be mispinned in the far connector, as the blue wire could be. Or the red wire can be mispinned in the near connector. Ditto for the blue. Let's move up to some more exotic problems. If you have the wrong parts installed on the aircraft, they could give the wire the appearance there's something wrong with it, when in reality, the wire is perfectly okay. For instance, this here is called a Bernie block. It's used to splice two or more wires together. The white lines indicate the separation of the splice points. So as we look at this J block, these two holes are connected together. These two holes are a separate splice, as well as these two and these two. There's four separate splices here. We can see this B block has two splices, here and here. To use this Bernie block, we install the red wire into this hole, then the wire you're going to splice to into the hole next to it. Then we do the same thing for the blue wire. Now you have two separate splices located in the correct position, as evidenced by the numbers on the track and back of the Bernie block. Now, what would happen if somebody accidentally took this B block and put it over there where the J block belonged? Any wire in this block are now shorted together. Worse yet, what if they put an 8 position splice block there? Then any extra wires installed in that block, such as these green wires, would now be electrically connected to your two wires. And this would rank very high on the totally not cool scale. Another problem encountered during troubleshooting is what I call phantom problems, or parallel circuits. Here we have a wire connecting point A to point B. Checking between the two wires with a meter, we see that it's open, as it should be. Let's add another wire run connected in parallel. And that second line has a red to blue short. You'll notice your meter now says that the original wire is shorted. So you have a phantom. You see a problem on wire AB when none exists. And every list of problems has to include workmanship issues. Here we have a section of wire. End to end continuity should show 2.2 ohms. However, an open does not necessarily mean that wire is bad. The problem could lie right here inside this connector. Let's take a look in there. An electrical contact is slid over the stripped wire, then it is crimped, completing the circuit. Let's take a look at what can go wrong here. Some types of wire have two layers of insulation. A very thin inner layer, as well as a thick outer layer. Normally, both layers are stripped, the contact is slid on, then crimped. But, if the wrong type of wire stripper is used, only the outer layer of insulation is pulled off, the contact then goes on, and then when it's crimped, you have no electrical continuity. Then the mistake is hidden inside the connector out of sight. Another workmanship issue could be improper connector buildup. 
This is called an MTC connector. It's a high density connector that allows many wires to be installed in one small area. The connector insert is then installed into the body of the connector. Now, in theory, the inserts have plastic keys to prevent them from being installed wrong. The connector bodies are simply made out of thin metal. Because of this, the insert can actually be forced in upside down. So when the connector is hooked up to the airplane, every contact is in the wrong position. So next time you hear somebody ask, it's only two wires, what could go wrong? You can say, funny you should ask, I happen to know the answer. Uh, let's talk about multimeter use. We want to check this wire end to end. Normally we take our meter, we hook up the black lead to one end, the red lead to the other end, and you get a continuity reading on the meter. Pretty simple. But most meter leads are only about three feet long. So what happens when you want to check a wire that's 150 feet long? Well, here's a workaround. Hook up your meter to the first end of the wire, then attach a second lead to a good ground. And then place a ground on the other end of the wire that you're checking. The two grounds will act like a really long test lead completing your circuit. Here I'm using green arrows to show the circuit path for the multimeter. Before using this method, I must warn you, there is some risk involved. Here's a short video showing the potential outcome. Okay, that might be a little over-exaggerating, but you get the point. Always ensure the meter leads you're using are insulated. Let's take a look at where this danger comes from. Hooking up your meter is pretty safe. The internal resistance of the meter is very high, so there's almost no chance of arcing. However, when you hook up your jumper on the other side, you're creating a direct short to ground. And by definition, since you're troubleshooting, there's something wrong with the wire you're checking. If the connector is miswired, you could have 28 volts on the line you're going to be checking. 28 volts plus a ground equals an arc. Or remember our friend the parallel circuits? Your wire could be in the correct position in the connector, but voltage is being supplied through the parallel circuit. Once again, you have an arc. Fluke multimeters are pretty forgiving, and they actually try to tell you there's voltage on a line when there shouldn't be. While measuring continuity, you expect to see OL or open. If you see a number that's constantly changing, or a negative number, that means you possibly have voltage on that line. If you see either of those conditions, simply switch the meter selector over to volts DC or volts AC and it'll show you the offending voltage. Other precautions you may want to consider. While hooking up your jumper, install it in the connector first, then hook it to ground. The reason? The arc will occur at the last connection that's made. Arcs cause damage that have to be repaired. So when selecting your ground, Use something that's easy to repair, for example, ground straps. It's a lot easier to replace a ground strap than to fix a connector. Okay, moving on. There's a minimum number of measurements that have to be done before you can call a wire good. For a two-wire system, you must make five measurements. An easy way to remember these measurements is the acronym EGO. This stands for end, ground, and other. The other part of this equation is the other end of the wire. Here's how it works. Take your meter and measure the red wire end to end. You should have good continuity. Then measure your blue wire end to end, good continuity. Then measure the blue wire to ground, it should be open. And then the red wire to ground, it should be open. And finally, measure from red to blue, that should be open. We just covered measuring a short wire. If you have to measure a long wire where you're using a ground return, you do the same tests. It just looks different. Let's take a look. First you test the red wire end to end for good continuity. Then you remove the ground jumper. The meter should show open, indicating no shorts to ground. Test the blue wire end to end. Remove the jumper and verify an open to ground. Finally, ensure there's an open between red and blue. And there you have it, a good wire. While we're talking about long wire runs, let me make a point. The resistance your meter is going to show you is going to be related directly to two things. How long is your wire and how many connectors are you going through? This 25-foot wire may read 2.2 ohms. Add more wires and another connector, and it could go to 4.4. And 150 feet could be all the way up to 6.8. Generally speaking, less than 10 ohms should be considered good. Let's talk about some troubleshooting strategies. Here we have a wire bundle, segments A through E. After checking the blue wire with a multimeter, we find out we have an open. The quickest way to find this problem is to split the circuit in half. Disconnect connector C, then move your ground over to the blue wire. We got lucky. Since the meter still indicates an open, that means wire segments CD or DE is bad. Again, split the circuit in half. Disconnect connector D, then move your ground over. The meter changed to 2.2 ohms. 
meaning this is a good wire, which further indicates wire segment CD is the bad wire. You've successfully troubleshot that wire run. Let's look at another example, short circuit. We have the same wire run, and the meter shows the blue wire is shorted to ground. Notice I don't have a ground line hooked up to the other end. Using the same procedure, split the circuit in half. Since the meter went to open, that means C, D, and E are all good. Hook C back up again. Now split the remaining untested circuit in half. The meter went to open, which means segment B, C is good. Which finally tells us wire segment A, B was the bad wire. Okay, let's complicate things and add a parallel circuit. Starting out with the same wire run, A through E. We'll tie in parallel circuit F, G. First, here's some good news. Troubleshooting an open in a parallel circuit is pretty straightforward. Let's assume the blue wire is open right here. When we hook the meter up on that leg, it will show the open. When we move the test ground to the parallel circuit, the meter will say that's a good wire. In short, an open on the bottom leg has no effect on the top leg. Likewise, an open on the top leg will not affect meter readings on the bottom leg. So when you go to troubleshoot this open wire, you can then use the same split the circuit in half method that you used on the single wire. Here's where our problem comes in. A short on a parallel circuit. Remember I mentioned phantom problems earlier? Well this is it. Here the red and blue wires are shorted on wire segment FG. The meter shows a 4.5 ohm short between red and blue. Unfortunately, that's exactly the same reading you'll get if wire BC is shorted. Here's why. Here I've drawn in the meter circuit path for segment BC being shorted. Moving my test ground up to segment FG, the meter circuit path will once again go through the short, then over to the parallel circuit run, travel up the blue wire to your ground, and then back to the meter. To troubleshoot this problem, you have to isolate the branches from each other. The conductors in BC are shorted together, and your meter is showing a 4.5 ohm short. To determine which leg is shorted, go to your tie point and remove the conductors from wire FG. You can see the meter is still showing that short between B and C. Likewise, you can remove the conductors from wire segment ABC. You'll notice the meter now says open. This is telling us that wire segments F, G, D, and E are all good. At this point, you can fall back to your standard single wire troubleshooting techniques. Let me tell you about another troubleshooting tool. It's called Experience. It can significantly shorten the amount of time it takes to find a problem. Let's take a look at an example. Here, we have a circuit that has a problem of some sort. Instead of saying the problem could be anywhere, some components are more prone to breaking. And you'll learn to recognize which components those may be. Let me show you how to do that. Every type of connector follows a particular convention as far as numbering the pins. For example, this connector here has a contact labeled K3 and it's connected to an LRU. This tells me it's most likely an Arring connector. Here we have the schematic symbol for our Bernie block. These two connectors have an A or B, followed by a number 1 through 20, so we'll say both of those are MTC connectors. Finally, the last two connectors just have whole numbers or letters, so they'll fall under the category of a standard radial connector. Stepping back and looking at the whole picture, this is what we have. A bunch of extra words. Let's change the words to something a little more useful, like pictures. Okay, the first thing this diagram shows me is what test equipment or test probes I need to take to the airplane to start troubleshooting. I also know the physical characteristics of each type of connector, so we can determine the likelihood of whether or not there is a problem. The Aaron connector is a proven to be reliable connector that's been around a long time. The most common problem you'll find with this connector is the LRU just isn't mounted properly. Here we have our problem child, the Burnley block. The reliability of this part actually depends on how old it is. If the airplane is fresh from the factory or has seen less than one year of service, this is where you'll find most of your problems. Here's why. When wires are initially installed, sometimes they're not locked into place properly. This means they can initially seem good, make an electrical contact, but the vibration of the aircraft works the wire out, which results in an open circuit. This problem is easily found with a quick pull check, or if you suspect a miswire, simply count wires. You know how many wires belong in that block. If you have one too many or one too few wires, there's your problem. Let's move on to the MTC connector. In my opinion, they're the second worst thing ever done to aviation electrical systems. When you look inside of an MTC connector, what you'll see is the electrical contacts are small, flat, thin, and mounted very close to each other. The pin arrangement on this connector looks somewhat like this. Hooking this connector up is pretty much a three-step process. You do a quarter turn on this fastener, 
the full half turn on this fastener to engage it. Then go back to the first fastener and finish engaging that one. This process allows those delicate pins to slide into the sockets without a lot of side bending. It also presents us with two problems. If someone just twists the mount screw all the way in without doing the walking process, these outboard pins can be bent. Or if they forget to go back and finish tightening up that first fastener, these pins won't be making electrical contact and you'll have an open. Now, how does this knowledge help us? When you see a schematic diagram and it has MTC connectors on it, one connector is contact A1 and the other connector is contact A7, you'll know the connector with contact A1 is your most probable problem. This is because contact A7 is located near the middle of the connector and it's a lot more difficult to damage that contact. Okay, moving on. Generally speaking, if your circuit has wiring located inside of a shelf, there's very little chance there's a problem with it. Shelf wiring is checked in the factory before it's installed on the airplane. And in service, the shelf itself helps protect that wiring from damage. The final connectors are our radial connectors. Don't expect to find any bent pins on these. They're a good connector. What I would like to cover with these connectors is this part of the wiring diagram. You'll notice the bottom part of this connector is smooth and round. While the bottom part of this connector has that jagged cutoff look. What this is telling us is that every pin that's in that connector is being shown on this diagram. While over here it means that there are many contacts in the connector, but only these two contacts are shown in this diagram. Now that we know that little tidbit of information, when presented with these two connectors, I'm wondering which one could be the problem. This connector here would be your most likely candidate, because if it's not hooked up, only the system you're working on will be broken. If this connector weren't hooked up, in addition to your broken system, there would most likely be other broken aircraft systems, and you would know about them. So, to summarize what we just looked at, to troubleshoot this circuit, I would suspect the problem to be here first. If not there, then here is a second choice. And my last choice would be this connector right here being disconnected. And remember, you can always fall back on the tried and true split the circuit in half troubleshooting theory. Hang in there, we're almost done. I'd like to mention something useful when it comes time to troubleshoot a wire to shield short. Remember this diagram? Standard shielded wire. One end is dead-ended, the other end is hooked to ground. Now, let's say there was a short from red to shield. Because of the way these wires are manufactured, the most probable cause of the short is either located here at the zap, zap is the name of your jumper, or over here at the dead end. The meter is reading 1.2 ohms. Unfortunately, even if you move your meter to the other side of the wire, it will still read 1.2 ohms. At this point, you flip a coin to figure out which end to disassemble. If you got lucky, you fixed it. If not, rework is required. If you're lucky enough that you're working on a really long wire, let me show you a workaround. Let's assume the short circuit's located at the dead end. Measure continuity here gives you 1.2 ohms because you're close to it. But when you move your meter to the other side of the wire, your reading will be higher. This is because you're reading through 250 feet of wire and structure. So, now in addition to knowing where your short is, you got to enjoy some exercise while you walked 125 feet. I'd like to finish this video up by telling you about a tool that's every technician's best friend. Let's say you work for an aviation company that's schedule driven. Hmm, never seen one of those before. Or you work for a company that likes happy technicians. Well then, that company would provide you with a 2020 TDR. TDR stands for Time Domain Reflectometer. In its basic form, it's a radar for wires. When you hook the TDR up to the wire you're checking, the display screen will show you a virtual plethora of knowledge about that wire. Remember our previous example? Instead of guessing or running around the airplane, you simply hook the meter up to either end, and the TDR will tell you you have a short and how many feet away it is from that end. I can't overemphasize the usefulness of this tool. It'll tell you if antennas are hooked up without pulling ceiling or floor panels. It'll show you open wires and how far away they're located, as well as shorted wires the location of good splices, as well as bad splices, a pinched coax, if the quality of your coax cable is degraded, and the list goes on. But that'll be a topic of another video. Well, I hope some of the information I've shared with you today will make your avionics life easier. I want to finish up by saying thanks for watching.